I would like to hear from you the three key elements if we want to cut the elephant in small pieces where we really need to focus to do the basics right before enlarge the picture. But I would like to hear what are the leaders expecting from us, young African? My question is what are the expectations and views from Africa and India with respect to this conference and what can they do both together to have a successful ministerial conference? Now, with the Africa uh, trade, free trade uh, agreements that came into effect in January last year, the UN is currently estimating that it could boost the intra-Africa trade by 33%. So what are your views uh, of the potential emerging progress uh, should this agreement uh, be implemented uh, to its full capacity or as, as much as possible? And how do you see the role of third parties and key partners to Africa in this context, especially with the interest that we see uh, from the Indian side uh, into, uh, into uh, this agreement? AFCTA, as the African Continental Free Trade Area, uh, you're absolutely right, uh, it could be a game changer. Um, one of the um, real drawbacks for African trade uh, is precisely uh, what you pointed out, the statistic, you know, about 17% of um, African export is intra-African, uh, intra-African trade. And clearly, uh, the AFCTA uh, is um, hopefully going to completely change that and um, really deliver development for, for the continent. Uh, for instance, in fact, coming back to the issue of the gender uh, uh, aspect, it's really something that uh, we even empower women because, you know, uh, the informal sector uh, of Africa um, is uh, predominated by, by women, actually. And um, so an AFCTA that removes, you know, import duties and, um, you know, another uh, tari uh, tariffs will now mean that more women are going to be able to be mainstream business-wise, you know, and, uh, and empower uh, you know, African uh, uh, women uh, in, uh, in in trade, and it's going to lead, lead to so many, <coughs> you know, uh, other uh, benefits. You know, with uh, greater uh, productivity markets, uh, it'll encourage manufacturing uh, by African countries. India and Ghana have, over the years, have very good relations, and India has been uh, a big brother. To Ghana in its development agenda. Um, I would say so far it's been good between Ghana and India. And when you come to Ghana, uh, Indian businessmen and entrepreneurs are all over the place. They find Ghana to be a very conducive country to do business and the government to have been very, very supportive. India, in the course of doing this business, has opened opportunities in financing a lot of projects in Ghana, which uh, a lot of Indian businessmen have taken advantage of and also um, have diversified into areas where Ghana think it will be beneficial to the country when we have, let's say, external partners or external investors coming in. Mm -hmm. So to date, India, like I said, has been a big brother. We recognize that relationship. We started all the way in the 60s during the independence time of the colonials. Mm -hmm. And it has continued. And from the political angle, long line between the two leaders at that time, India has helped Ghana to transform into an economic uh, giant, at least within this uh, West Africa region. Mm -hmm. uh, when you talk of uh, Big Brother Nigeria, uh, the next country that uh, you fortunately talk about when it comes to industrial transformation into Ghana. Mm -hmm. And India, I have to say, and go on record, that India has stand tall with Ghana and assisted Ghana and continues to assist Ghana. It's been releasing large uh, swaps of uh, lines of credit mm -hmm. for Ghana to go into all kinds of areas. And so um, it has been very positive between Ghana and India, and I think we are on the right track to get there. As for the economic difficulties and challenges, it will always be there. Because even if we take the first one for the European countries, they do have economic challenges, just that is relative. Now the development of Africa at the end of the day is for the African leaders to be able to identify the areas that they want their economic development to be. 
And so far, I would say that India, we talk of India's uh, support has always been project-led. And for me, it's a good thing to be that, uh, let's say if your issue is to do with a grid, and you need assistance to develop it. And India, so far, has always demonstrated that if you need a help in a grid, we'll come in and deal with projects in there, instead of actually releasing money for you to go and maybe uh, Africa so far hasn't had the uh, we haven't been that good when the money are just released and left to us to use it as we want. And I think India has learned something for it to make sure that when we are releasing the support or we are coming in to support you, we want projects that are important to you to be identified. Yes, Africa can live from ICT uh, as a perspective. And I'll just give a few examples. But I, I want to put in the bedlock of that one key element. Any form of development will be sustainable and will allow this problem if it's only citizen-centric. If it focuses on the prosperity and well-being of the people. And that's where I'm going to use my examples from. Uh, and it's part of what India and, and Rwanda have done together as well, or how we have partnered and learned from one another. And for example, the use of drones. We have used drones um, initially for blood and medicine for vision for the people. For those who live on Rwanda, it's commonly known as the land of a thousand hills. And that makes moving around the country a little bit harder if you're just going to use an ambulance on the road. But ICT can be adjusted for the well-being of people. Through drones, we are able to deliver blood, we are able to deliver ARVs uh, on, on people with uh, HIV AIDS. We are able really to bring meaningful life to the people within a very uh, precise and short period. The same applies to, uh, to the agriculture sector, and I know India has been doing very well on that, where we are using precision farming. It is still on a very small scale, but we are able to know when to add, when to irrigate, through the use of drones as well. So um, that is key. And when we talk of the use of ICT as a service delivery uh, channel or vehicle, we are also talking about dealing with certain issues that affect us mostly on the continent. With the use of ICT, we are able to adjust on issues of corruption, on issues of transparency, on issues of accountability, but also on issues of fast service delivery. So we've seen, um, of course, the investment in the ICT sector partnering uh, partnership in the investing of that area and making it easier. You know, uh, our farmers now can access markets through a platform of ICT without having a lot of middle. And, and that allows how much money goes into the pockets of farmers and that motivates farmers to farm the more because what they put as inputs can be really seen as outcomes without losing that whole process of it. So yes, Africa can leapfrog by not taking exactly the same route that everyone took in the development journey, but by catching up where uh, development is going, and of course by embedding in its approaches and methods, uh, systems that allow efficiency, effectiveness, and of course service delivery to the people. But uh, the Rwandan story really is built on intended and transformational leadership. So this and many other projects are only possible when all the partnership, all the acts are intended on the prosperity and transformation of the lives of the people and in an inclusive way as I said earlier. And I think Rwanda is, uh, uh, is Africa in a particular place, I would say. And the African free trade area and the um, uh, on the Agenda 2063 that he mentioned, clarifies the ambitions that the continent has. And Rwanda has embedded those ambitions. Of course, you will add that we are also part of the globe, of the globe. And uh, the SDG 2060, uh, I mean 2030, is a very driving force for us. So very key elements. Climate change is real. And therefore, dealing with climate change and adjusting to climate change, is an area that we all need to win, that we all need to engage with. Uh, food production, you know, 
but also agro-processing. Uh, I think it was earlier mentioned, food security is going to be a common issue for all of us. Uh, India and Africa have a beautiful, but also very simple challenge. We are having a youthful generation. That gives us an advantage of the future. The advantage of being in charge of the labor, the markets of the future, but also the disadvantage if we mismanage that population, if we do not create the right jobs, if we do not give the right skills to that youthful population that we share, uh, both India and, and Africa, then we are at a very uh, slippery level. So, skills development is a very core element. And preparing not only the Rwandans but also the Africans to be uh, able citizens of the world who will make contributions that will be really intentional in dealing with the challenges. But as you mentioned earlier, one of the biggest challenges, uh, Africa is, uh, is bringing commodities on the market. And that makes it extremely expensive for us. I think there is a uh, cheaper level. We can use the skills that we need on the continent and do not just make it out of Africa, but also make it in Africa. And I think the core element is, can we make it Africa and take it out of Africa at a value? And there is areas of investment in that. So investment trade is going to be driving. And I think I will answer the, uh, the development first approach. And that if we do development first, we do development sustainable. Otherwise, there will be interventions that are just against poverty. And sometimes it's very hard to use you have to use developmental and prosperity approaches to really deal with issues of poverty. Thank you. My name is Uduaka Mimo, and my question um, goes to the uh, um, African ministers on the panel. Um, in your opening remarks, um, you talked about uh, the relationship, your individual country relationships with India, and how India supports. Um, African countries, and so could you please elaborate on what your individual countries offer India? Uh, of course, we'll increase the quantity and the quality of the products. They also trade with the, uh, with the outer world. So um, we have heard for maybe, maybe decades about the uh, connectivity roads, about the trans highway uh, roads between African countries. And uh, I think we, in Egypt we have built most of our part. So my, my question to the African speakers: What uh, what is uh, what is hindering uh, the the road connectivity between uh, the African countries? Thank you. Uh, my question for any of actually it can be uh, for any of the uh, members of the panel: Do you think there is uh, a leadership? and coordination between the leadership of the African leaders to address the issue of economic integration at the moment. To address uh, the issue of? To pursue, you know, with the, uh, the African agenda of economic and regional integration mm -hmm. and to respond to uh, global trends and developments uh, regards to trade uh, and economic issues. Thank you. Um, one of the um, real drawbacks for African trade uh, is precisely uh, what you pointed out, the statistic, you know, about 17% of um, African export is intra-African uh, uh, intra trade. And clearly, uh, the AFCTA uh, is um, hopefully going to completely change that and um, really deliver development for, for the continent. Uh, for instance, in fact, coming back to the issue of the gender, uh, uh, Aspect, it's really something that uh, it even empower women because you know uh, the informal sector uh, of Africa um, is uh, predominated by, by women actually. And um, so, an AFCTA that removes you know import duties and um, you know another uh, tari uh, tariffs will now mean that more women are going to be able to be mainstream business-wise, you know, and, uh, and empower, uh, you know, African uh, uh, women uh, in, uh, in, in trade. And it's going to lead, lead to so many, you know, uh, other uh, benefits, you know, with, uh, and greater uh, 
productivity market, uh, it'll encourage manufacturing uh, by Africa. It's key. And when we talk of the use of ICT as a service delivery uh, channel or vehicle, we are also talking about dealing with certain issues that affect us mostly on the continent. With the use of ICT, we are able to adjust on issues of corruption, on issues of transparency, on issues of accountability, but also on issues of fast service delivery. So we've seen, um, of course, the investment in the ICT sector, but during uh, partnership in the investing of that area and making it easier, you know, uh, our farmers now can access markets through a platform of ICT without having a lot of middle. And, and that allows how much money goes into the pockets of farmers and that motivates farmers to farm the more because what they put as inputs can be really seen as outcomes without losing that whole process of it. So yes, Africa can live through by not taking exactly the same route that everyone took in the development journey, but by catching up where uh, development is going, and of course by embedding in its approaches and methods uh, systems that allow efficiency, effectiveness, and of course service delivery to the people. But uh, the Rwandan story really is built on intended and transformational leadership. So this and many other projects are only possible when all the partnership, all the acts are intended on the prosperity and transformation of the lives of the people and in an inclusive way as I said.